Now I'd like to welcome, I'm sorry, pardon me. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Matteo Caulfield, Georgetown University, class of 2023. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining today's forum event hosted by the Institute of Politics and Public Service at the McCourt School of Public Policy, known to many of you as Geopolitics. My name is Matteo Caulfield, and I'm a junior in the college studying government and classics from Wheaton, Illinois. I had previous involvement with Geopolitics through its student strategy teams. Last spring, I worked for Geopolitics fellow Sarah Sendek, the former public affairs director for the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, who helped secure the 2020 election. I'm also proud to be the president of the Georgetown Bipartisan Coalition. It is a student-led organization dedicated to bridging the political divide in this country and on Georgetown University's campus. We conduct roundtables, host debates, and create social events in order to keep college Republicans and college Democrats in dialogue with each other. As an Illinois Republican myself, I have seen my local party leaders have a spectrum of reactions to today's speakers, but personally remain in proud support of a representative who chooses to put country over party. Tonight, we are joined by Representative Adam Kinzinger for an important and timely conversation given the moment we find ourselves in as a nation. Tonight, Geopolitics is proud to launch How to Heal, a series on pushing through polarization. We all have seen how polarization can impact our lives far beyond the ballot box. This era of deep cultural and political division has also translated over into our views of justice, opportunity, freedom, and society. So here at Geopolitics, we want to focus on the issue of polarization. We want to explore its causes, how it impacts our collective sense of unity and community, and what we can do to move past it and come together for the common good. Featuring guests from diverse perspectives and different walks of public life, How to Heal explores ways we can move past polarization that defines our politics, our public health, and so many other aspects of society. Join us as we welcome our first speaker to launch the series, Representative Adam Kinzinger. This event is being co-sponsored by the Georgetown University College Republicans and the Georgetown University Bipartisan Coalition. Please join the conversation on social media by tagging Geopolitics using at Geopolitics and the official event hashtag, hashtag how to heal. Now I'd like to welcome onto the stage Mo Alethi and Representative Adam Kinzinger. Look at this crowd. Poya Saxa, everyone. Yeah. Um, thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you, Congressman. Welcome yeah, back. Thanks. Good Welcome to be back, back to Georgetown. Welcome back to GU Politics. We were uh, just reminiscing backstage that the last time you were here was for a panel discussion we did back in the day on uh, the politics of Syria, mm. back when people were actually still talking about Syria. Um, so, um, Thank you, you were great then, and we're excited to have you here tonight for our inaugural event in our new How to Heal series. Um, and look, here's the thing. Like the last couple of years have sucked, <laughs> right? They've totally sucked. You've had, you know, between a global pandemic and the summer of 2020 and all the racial upheaval that we saw, and then a 2020 presidential election that we are still arguing over and that led to an insurrection at the United States Capitol. But I will say when we returned to campus last fall in September, there seemed to be a new energy. It was almost as if there was a mental turning of the corner for many of us that maybe we can start to move forward. Maybe this is a chance for us to heal socially, culturally, politically. So that's what this series is gonna focus on and we are so thrilled to have you here to help uh, begin to set the table for this conversation. So I'm gonna, we're gonna talk amongst ourselves for a little bit and then we're gonna- You're not even there. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. we're gonna actually be talking about you. Yeah. Um, 
and then we're going to open it up and ask you to, to join the conversation. Um, and my first couple of questions are really broad, so you can take it wherever you want to take it. But, you know, here's the thing. I, we've always had sharp elbows in our politics, right? And sometimes worse. We've had a war with ourselves over whether or not we should keep people in bondage. The 1960s were an incredibly tumultuous decade with, with riots and protests and political assassinations and the National Guard shooting college kids on college campuses. Is it worse now? Does it feel worse now? Give us your assessment. Before we talk about how to heal, help us diagnose the problem. How bad is it? Well, I mean, I think it feels worse for all of us because we're actually living it, right? right? You know, and it's not reading the history books about it. It is interesting, though, if you look back into the 60s and, you know, you recognize, I forget the number, but the number of political assassinations and attempted political assassinations is insane. And you can see when you see those numbers, like how people thought, you know, we may be at a point of society falling apart and somehow within that, it just kind of magically seemed to heal almost. I mean, I'm sure there's a whole number of things that the historians here can say, why did we heal? Um, but I, I think it's a lesson for us in terms of that to say, okay, society and life is always a bit of a pendulum. There's always moments you look and you say, things are really bad. And then there are people that come along and it heals, or maybe it's just a natural kind of social tendency to heal. And that's my hope, by the way, is that in the depth of kind of this terrible moment we're in, and I think we have to be honest about it. You know, you opened up and said it sucks. Yeah, it does suck. I mean, you know, it's like we're living a new chapter of Revelation every day here. <laughs> and, and so I, I think we have to recognize that and say, what is the answer? Is the answer for us going to be, you know, we're going to sit back and wait? for somebody to magically come along and fix it, or are we gonna be part of that solution? And I'm sure you'll get into these questions, but I wanna kind of have a little teaser here and say, I don't know if it's worse than it was in the 60s or not, but that is our choice. That's our determination. Do we wanna make this time be like the end of the story of America or the story of American democracy? Or do we want this to be one of those things that say, you know, it was dark before the light came? And that is a choice we all get to make. That's the awesome thing about self-governance. That's what you're seeing in Ukraine right now, are people that are willing to defend to the death their ability to determine their own future, their ability to say, we want to, you know, we want to be who we want to be, uh, you know, for us, we, we thankfully are not at a point where we have to give our lives for that cause. So actually the price is fairly easy at this moment, even if it doesn't feel that way. And I gotta tell you, it is gonna be your generation um, that will make that difference. Because there are too many kind of old people in politics that, that are still fighting the same battles they've always fought. You know, they're arguing the same stuff they were arguing in the 60s, right? Or, you know, the same solutions to the same problems. And you guys will be the one that are gonna have to come along and fix problems and also change how we deal with each other and make the determination that this is not gonna be worse than 1960 and it's gonna be the beginning of, of really an American comeback and renewal. Just another quick thing on that. And if you look back to, and I don't, I don't know the details of this as well because I actually am stealing this from somebody who's, uh, if you guys remember hearing about Pineapple Express. So back in Afghanistan, not the movie, I know the movie, so this is like the one where they rescued everybody in Afghanistan, like a different Pineapple Express. So back when Afghanistan was falling apart in August, there were a bunch of basically former special operators that had all these relationships in Afghanistan, and it led to basically thousands of people being rescued, not by the U.S. government, by, by, but by these kind of organic movements. And so a guy named Scott Mann has an organization called Rooftop, and and he keeps making the point, and I did his podcast actually about a week ago, that it was in the worst times, like right prior to you know, World War II, there were some real social problems in this country, and that's when you saw the rise of Future Farmers of America, a little organization called Alcoholics Anonymous, where two people got together and determined that they should you know, come up with a list of principles and steps to sober up. That's where you saw this massive social movement from the ground up. 
And that's what changed society. And that's the moment we're at now, and it's our determination. So there are a couple of different threads I want to pull on there. You've talked a lot about, uh, in the past, toxic tribalism and how dangerous that is to democracy. And I agree with you. I actually believe that these filter bubbles that we live in and that you know, through a series of conscious and subconscious decisions that we make every day are isolating uh, ourselves from one another. One of the things we talk about a lot at the Institute is the need to pop those every now and then and just try to see one another and hear one another. But here's the thing that scares me. I sometimes wonder if people want to hear and listen and understand one another, right? Like, you guys know I'm a Democrat, and I my side gig is I'm a Democrat at, on payroll at Fox News. And I get so many trolls that come after me, after my hits, and I didn't say, know you're a "Democrat, I'm out of here." Yeah, <laughs> I'm just kidding. And there it is. Um, <laughs> um, but you know, they come at me and they say, "I don't know why Fox employs you. You should go to CNN or MSNBC where you belong." You're not welcome here. You don't belong here. This is, you're invading our safe space. Talk a little bit about that. Like, how do we get past that? Are the American, do people really want to get past that? You know, it's a great question. And there's real comfort in whatever your social circle is. So if you think about when I was a kid, your friend group was kind of um, who lived in your neighborhood. Right? That was my friends that I played with, but that was also my parents' friends. They had friends, obviously, outside of that, but uh, you know, if you're out mowing your lawn and the neighbor's out, you may have a beer with the neighbor. That becomes kind of your social circle. That doesn't happen anymore. Uh, and I think it was particularly accelerated, too, with COVID. But now, people find their social circle on the Internet. So let's say you're pro-Second Amendment here, and so you decide, gee, I'm going to get my social circle in a pro-Second Amendment group or anti-Second, whatever it is, whatever the issue is. And so that becomes your social circle on Facebook. So you go home, you're on Facebook, you're on whatever, and you're typing, you're angry, you guys are all agreeing with each other. You feel like you belong to something, right? And we all want to belong. By the way, I actually think people fear... And this gets into a whole thing of like, why are politicians scared to take tough votes? I think people actually fear being kicked out of their social circle and isolated more than they fear death. And I think that is what, you know, part of the driving on that whole separate issue. But when it comes to things like now you're on Facebook, you're in a, let's say, a Second Amendment group. Let's say you're pro-Second Amendment. But you say, you know, I think the uh, age to purchase an AR should be raised from 18 to 21 because it's 21 to buy a pistol. And let's say you say that on that social group. Well, what's going to happen? Well, they're going to call you a rhino. I've been called a rhino before. You know, they're going to call... <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's a, that's a nice day for me. Um, but you will be kicked out of that circle. You'll be kicked out of that group. You don't belong here. And so I think people have gotten to the point where you know, thinking through things like how do I understand a problem from somebody's eyes? How do I empathize with them? It is hard work to do that, by the way. Um, the easy thing is just to find the group, because we have it with technology now, where you can belong, you don't have to think too much, and you can just sit there and feel good. So, yeah, I mean, I think what you're saying is a real problem. How do we get there is another question to where people want to change that. And I think some of that's social pressure, just social movements. But the baseline is this, and, and I would encourage all of you, if you don't have a friend that disagrees with you politically, uh, I mean, don't just go make a friend that you don't like, right? <laughs> but, like, try to find somebody that thinks differently from you. And try to have a, a just a, a, see if you guys can just talk to each other and understand from each other's eyes. So I'm going to tell you this. You take the furthest right, the furthest left person, um, and you boil down what is their fear. Okay? The only reason conflict exists is it, conflict arises from fear. So if you talk to somebody on the right and the left and you say, what is your fear? And they give you an answer and you go, no, no, deeper than that. What's your fear? What's your fear? For the most part in a political setting, People are scared that this country is not going to accept them or leave them behind. Okay? That is when now both people who have very different views recognize and look in each other's eyes and say, your fear is the exact same as mine. 
that disarms everybody and it begin, you begin to see things sympathetically. So get off the internet. But I mean, it's such, it's such a great point because, you know, I've, I'm, a, I'm a believer that we're sort of in this populist era, you know, because of that, because peop, everybody feels like they and their communities are being left behind. And you, you go and you talk in a rural community or in an inner city and you're hearing the same challenges, right? You're hearing the same concerns, but we're sort of conditioned to just assume the worst of, of the other. We've been doing some polling at the Institute over the past couple of years on the issue of civility and polarization, right? Like, what we want to get at is how bad do people think it is? Who do they blame? But do they really want it, right? And so how bad is it? Everyone thinks it's bad. Who do they blame? They kind of blame everybody, including their own team, but they kind of blame everybody. But it's that last question, do they really want more civility? Do they really want to tackle the polarization? If you ask them, do you want more civility in politics, like 93% say yes, yeah, right? That's the easy answer, yeah. But then ask the question a little bit differently. Agree or disagree with these statements. Number one, common ground and compromise are noble goals we want our leaders to aspire to. Like 78% say they agree with that, that they want common ground, that they want compromise. Very next question, agree or disagree. I'm tired of leaders who compromise on my values. I want them to stand up and fight the other side. 74% say they agree with that, right? Of course I want common ground. As soon as you're standing where I'm at, we'll be on common ground. Right. And you look at this manifest itself with you know, members of Congress who say crazy stuff and then can raise $3 million in $25 increments overnight, or people on cable news saying crazy stuff and the ratings go through the roof. So it brings me to the incentive structure, right? For yeah. those of you in the arena, like how do you walk that line when people are saying, no, I want you to get stuff done with the other side, just you know, don't compromise on anything that's important to me. Go ahead and say crazy stuff. Yeah, it's funny because I'll always say stuff like, you know, Civility, common ground, that kind of stuff. And then you always inevitably, if you look at Twitter, it's like, oh, I thought you were different because I'm actually a conservative Republican. And it's like, oh, I, I thought you were different. You thought, what, I was a liberal Democrat? I'm not. I just think that we ought to be able to coexist and make each other better in this process. And so, yeah, I mean, I think, I think there's moments where you either have to have mature leaders or a mature population. Okay? And I don't mean mature like pejoratively, like you're immature, but mature in terms of how you're looking at a political system at the moment. You can have crazy leaders, like we have right now. You can have crazy leaders, but if the population demands differently or demands better, then the country's fairly stable. If you have people with these passions, like this kind of populism is on fire, and I think this is more of what we've had in the past, but you've had leaders that then say, look, we understand what's, what, you know, the division that's being stoked and the anger, but we're still going to work together to achieve these things, then you can survive that. Unfortunately, we're at a moment where both are lost. And so you talk about the incentive structure. So, you know, Washington, D.C., and like the whole Capitol building, as cool as it is and ornate as it is, it was created for one reason. It's like a steam pot, like a, a pressure cooker. So you take all the anger and the division and the differences that exist in society, you distill them into that building, into political arguments, you have your political arguments, you let the steam out, and you have a solution. That's what that was all created for, was to prevent violence out here. And that allowed us to solve our problems. Well, what's happened is, and that's what the founding fathers kind of had in mind with this idea of a republic and not a direct democracy. Well, what's happened is with the new media environment, with the fundraising in, uh, uh, incentive structure, people now believe they know more than members of Congress, and members of Congress on whatever issue, members of Congress raise a ton of cash on fear. On fear. Because if I tell you that I am the one that's gonna protect either Nancy Pelosi or Mitch McConnell from killing your family, right? It's almost that bad in fundraising, you will part with anything, including your money, to prevent that from happening. If I truly believed that you were gonna kill my wife and kid, I would give you every dollar I had, right? Anybody would. 
And that's in essence what's been happening in politics. Because every difference, every issue now, we have laid out as a life and death thing for 12 years at least, or as long as I've been in politics, and it's just gotten worse and worse. So how do we change it? Well, that's the big question. That's the one I don't have the answer to, and I, I think we also need to, be, we need to be able to recognize when we don't have the answer to everything and say, but there's somebody out there that does. I don't know who it is. Maybe one of you which is how do we, within the, within the constraints of free speech in the Constitution, change the incentive structure so saying something crazy doesn't raise you your three million and you go out and win? I think there's gonna have to be some version of campaign finance reform, first off. But secondarily, we need people to recognize when they're being swindled, okay? How many of you here are on some, you signed up for some campaign thing and now you're getting like 30 spam emails a day. Now, by the way, that's doing more to radicalize people than just about anything. Because when you look at the headline in your inbox and you're seeing 30 different messages a day of this person's the devil, this person wants to kill you, everything, that, has, that, that messes with your mind. What we need is people to, throw, to vomit that out and say no more. Right, so I have this organization, Country First, and uh, you know, it's 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 trying to change this toxic tribalism. But one thing I refuse to do is to raise money on fear. So when we have to raise money, we do it in a way that's optimistic and hopeful, because I don't want to be part of radicalizing the country further. You put out a video today yeah, on I was Twitter. A little angry today. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Check it out. It's on Twitter. Uh, he was getting ready to, to do a whole tweet thread, and he's like, you know what? Let me just, let me just record this. Uh, it's a fun rant, but you, the, the, the crux of it is your colleagues are children, yeah. right? That's what you said, that, that my colleagues are children. Talk about that. Yeah, I mean, you know, the one, the one thing I would do differently if I, if I kind of went back in time to this morning and recorded it is I'd I try to end it on a more optimistic message, which is like, here is how we can make a difference. Because it's one thing to, to point out a problem, and I think we have to do that. I think we need to be clear about what the problem is. Um, but I was sitting there and, you know, look, Russia's invading Ukraine. On Fox News, you have Tucker Carlson that, you know, just asks questions sometimes, and he's... He made the comment about, why shouldn't I root for Putin? Or why is it that you, why are we told we can't root for Putin? Is it, you know, did Putin, whatever his list of issues were? Um, we have members of Congress that say like, oh yeah, I mean, sure, we want Ukraine to win, but Zelensky's corrupt. No, he's not. You know, and, and all this kind of stuff, when this is a serious moment, none of us in this room, unless there's a World War II veteran in here, has ever been at a moment in the world so important geopolitically as right now. Because for 80 years, we have all benefited from the fact that, you know, the United States has been at least in the top couple countries at any moment. We live in a fairly secure world. Our biggest threat is nuclear weapons, but, you know, that's kind of, yes, it's existential, but we know nobody's going to really start launching nukes at each other. And we know that nation borders pretty much stay the same. This is the first time in 80 years that we have seen, for the sole purpose of a land grab or to exterminate a country, something like this happening. This is a very serious moment. I've been to the country of Georgia a couple of times, and I gotta tell you too, they've been sitting there with a third of their country occupied, and we've pretended like it didn't happen in 2014 Ukraine. So all this is going down, and I'm hearing about the latest outrage that's being provoked is that Disney, came out opposed to the Florida law. And so now there's all this boycott Disney, outrage of the day, it used to be Dr. Seuss. And look, I hate cancel culture on the right and left, by the way, um, I hate all of it. But what I also hate too is this like stoking cultural anger and division for the sole purpose of ratings and money. And so I just sat down and said, look, at the most important moment in world history that any of us have ever been alive in, and hopefully will ever be alive in, because I don't want it to get any worse. Like, we are sitting here debating the latest cultural issue, the cultural fight. You are being governed by a bunch of children. Look, there are good members of government, clearly, there really are. But a lot of people getting the attention are a bunch of kids that don't understand the gravity of this moment. 
to an extent, I think we're, 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 we kind of suffer from an embarrassment of riches of sort, like of living in such security, of, of you know, being as, in essence, wealthy as we are as a nation, that we have the ability to sit around and argue about Walt Disney. Um, but I was furious this morning, and I think it's important for us to put that message out to folks to just say, demand better, right? And when we talk about compromise and common ground, I'm not talking about somebody giving up what they believe and going and becoming moderate or squish or not arguing. I, like, keep that, but recognize you live in a society with people that are different than you. And by the way, if you get married, that's something you got to learn, too. You're going to have to coexist with somebody very different from you. And, uh, and that's, a good, that's a good art and a good skill. Yeah, there's, there's just that last point reminded me of this polling that I've seen that shows, you know, it's been asking for several years, um, w would you be offended if your child married outside of your fill in the blank? Yeah. And um, for the first time in recent years, uh, outside your party, offends more people than outside race or religion. Yeah. So I guess in a that's way it's progress. good and yeah. bad. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I uh, want you to think about that too for a second. Like, actually, the most arbitrary thing in the world that you should pick a friend on if you really think about it is their view of government. Like, it's like the most arbitrary. Like, I want to pick a friend on who I like to hang out with. You know, who has common interests. Your view of government is actually the stupidest reason to go find somebody as a friend, but that's what we all use. Um, in a few moments, we're going to open up the conversation uh, to all of you, so start thinking about your questions. Um, so, like, <laughs> we're painting a pretty bleak picture here, right, in yeah. this conversation. Like, our motto at the Institute, no joke, our motto is public service is a good thing, politics can be too. Like, is there a reason that we should keep that motto? Like, based on this conversation, I don't know. I mean, what, where's the, where is the optimism that we can turn the corner and that through politics affect the kind of change you're arguing we need, the kind of healing that you're arguing we need? So that's a great point, is recognizing, you know, the first step, right, to, to recognizing your problem is admitting you have a problem. We have a problem. Now, why am I optimistic and how can we kind of heal and why is politics still a, an honorable thing to get in? Well, first off, for me, I represent 750,000 people. So I was flying home my freshman year. I'm looking out the window, flying back to Chicago, and I just see this, you know, I'm a pilot. You know how you know if you're in the room with a pilot, he'll tell you. Um, or she'll tell you. But I'm looking out the window and I see this giant city and I realize that's probably a city of 100,000 people. And I'm like, I represent like seven times that. And, and so from, whether it's on the city council, whether it's Congress, whether it's anything, you recognize that no matter what the environment is in politics, you're the voice for people that are angry, they're upset, or they're happy, but you're the one that has to take their voice. From a staff perspective, if you're working for a member of Congress, you're actually like the Congress person because staff is so important. And so that is where we can make real change. That is where we can make a real difference. And until we actually put good people in this business that are willing to put their careers on the line, by the way, to say the right thing, to say what needs to be said, um, then it's going to get worse. But that's why I'm optimistic, because your guys' generation, I got to tell you, is so interested in engaging this stuff, and they're so fed up that we're not going to see a generation of people that are fed up and say, we're just not going to pay attention. You all are fed up, and you're going you're gonna to be spurned to action. So that's why I really do believe, otherwise I wouldn't even be doing this. I mean, honestly, I'd go like, you know, figure out how to live the rest of the time in a secure country as best I can until we all fall apart. I really believe that we're at the end of those dark moments and that we're going to come back pretty strong from this. Uh, but that's, a, that's a, literally in your guys' hands. There are two standing mics, one in each aisle. Um, we're going to start taking your questions now, so just start lining up at those microphones. And when, um, when uh, it's your turn, I'll call on you. Uh, tell us who you are, your school, your year. Uh, where you're from, and then your question as succinctly as possible. So feel free to start taking to the mics. 
And let's start right over here. Hi. Hi. Is this on? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, I'm Kesley. I'm a freshman in the college. I'm studying biology, although that is another issue. Um, <laughs> We can call my mom about that. <laughs> but my question is that you guys have painted this picture of everybody who thinks that their issue is life or death. And I want to know how we make the decision of who has to compromise and who feels like who gets to choose like which issues have to give or where we actually have to compromise. Because like I can say like, yeah, there are issues that I would compromise on, but I can say that because I'm not a member of necessarily the groups that feel like they're being under attack, if that makes any sense. That's a great question. And uh, by the way, just so you know, as you're trying to figure out biology, I failed out of college my first year because I was in a fraternity and <laughs> I worked in a department store for six months, reapplied to the college, then got all straight A's, but changed my major in that process. So no matter what you challenge with, you too can be a congressman, even if you... <laughs> My second semester GPA was a .8. <laughs> Listen, you gotta work hard to get a .8, okay? All right, so that's a little, little about me. In terms of how to figure out compromise, th this is the art. This is the art of human interaction. There's no science to it. There's no metric you can put on an issue and say, this is X important to you, it's Y important to me, here's the mathematical solution. It is human interactions. You know, if you're, if you're married or you're dating somebody, how is it that you figure out if you go to Applebee's or Chili's, the two best restaurants in the world, right? There's not necessarily a science behind it, but there's, you have interactions and you figure this out. There are gonna be tough issues that we'll never come to a solution on. Probably, you know, guns, abortion, all those ones that nobody wants to talk about at the dinner table, including me. Um, and so you're gonna have differences on those. But there are also things like, let's take the issue of immigration. There are some people that say, we just want border security. Some that say, we just want you know, amnesty or, or a legal path to citizenship. Actually, I'll tell you what, if we secure the border, we put a legal path to citizenship and uh, you know, X, Y, Z, that's a 90% issue that Americans agree with. We could solve immigration easier than any issue, but we're not doing it because I, both sides have kind of set back in their corners. And that's where, when it comes to compromise, there's going to be some things you don't solve. But I always say, if there is a, you know, if I have to vote on the floor for a spending bill or whatever the bill is, and I say neither side likes it, usually it's a pretty good compromise. And so, yeah, the, the bottom line is there's no scientific thing, it's art. But that's what all human interaction is. Um, if my future partner picks, if the options are Applebee's and Chili's, we're divorcing. Yeah, that's probably smart. <laughs> pretty smart. No, no compromise there. The Clubhouse Grill at Applebee's is pretty good, though. But let me, let me just follow up on that real quick, because, you know, I was thinking back to what you said just a couple of answers ago, where you said um, your views on government are the stupidest reason to pick a, uh, pick a friend, right? There are some people, maybe in this room, who would say, I don't know about that, who would say, you know what? Like, after Charlottesville, that was a legit reason to pick a friend. That after an insurrection, that's a legit reason to pick a friend. And I had some students who, who came into my office right after the insurrection, and we were calling for civility, and it's not civility is not the issue. Justice is the issue. Oh, yeah. Fairness is the yeah. issue. And, and I didn't really know what to say, right? When you feel like your way of life, your identity, is under assault, how do you approach healing in that case? And I don't know that any of us have figured that out yet. No, I don't think so. And, you know, but I, I would say this, like, it's one thing on the macro level to say an insurrection. I mean, I was in the insurrection. I wasn't part of it. I'm on the committee investigating it. Um, on a macro level, that's a huge deal. I, I also know that some of my friends that in Congress that have voted differently than me on these January 6 issues, some of them think they're actually voting the right way. I don't agree with them. But I think there's a difference between the macro and the micro. Um, but I would encourage you, the more you sit at home filled with hate, filled with anger, filled with fear, the shorter you're going to live and the more miserable your life is going to be. All right. Thanks so much for your question. Let's go over here. Um, OK. Uh, hi, I'm Luke. I'm a freshman in the college um, from Boston looking to major in math. And I just want to say thank you so much for coming to campus. Um, and so my question is, 
how do you recommend us having these conversations with family members? Because we don't want to, well, because you don't want to isolate like your grandparents or your aunts and uncles, but you also love them and don't want them to fall into this trap. And so to what extent do you recommend us having these conversations and like how far should we go? How should we approach it? I'm glad you asked that question. It's really good. First off, you know, I, I think a lot of times with family, you don't need to. Um, I think in some cases, if mom or dad has been, you know, radicalized by this TV station or the other, there's really no benefit to trying to convince them otherwise. I think in that case, it's just to show love. Um, at the same time, you don't have to subject yourself to abuse. You know, this, the recent, one of the recent uh, January 6th rioters that was uh, convicted and put in prison, his son had to testify against him and said, my dad threatened to kill me if I, ta if I told the law enforcement about his involvement in January 6th. That is a toxic relationship. A year ago, I got a letter from my dad's cousins, and it started out with, oh my, what a disappointment you are to us and to God. And it went through how I've lost the trust of Mark Levin. I'm like, oh, great, good. And, uh, but it was my dad's cousins disowning me because of my position on January 6th. I didn't try to convince them. I forgave them in my heart, and I cut off all contact with them, and I have no desire to ever see or hear from these people again. So I think to the extent your parents and stuff, whatever, the, like, you don't need to. Um, and I know it's hard sometimes if, you know, but just try to love them the best you can. But if something's toxic and it's harming you, then, then cut, it, cut it off. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, thank you so much for coming to talk with us. To be honest, that was kind of my question, but I just kind of wanted to dig in a little deeper on that. Um, so maybe not when you're talking with family members, but say peers or people on the internet who maybe even make it explicit that they are not willing at all to budge on a certain point of view. Like, are there rhetorical tactics that you can use to like, maybe lead them to piece apart their own argument or what's worked for you? Yeah, I mean, look, I... And I'm a victim of getting too involved in Twitter sometimes too, right? So I, I don't have it all together. I want to be clear. Um, I think the problem with the internet, with Twitter, stuff like that, Twitter is a fantastic thing if you're a public servant to be able to get a message out. Like the video today, 400,000 views. I wouldn't have had that any other way. Um, but the problem is you're now faceless. So we have something, and I encourage you guys to go look. Uh, Country First, we're doing something called a, a Unify Challenge. And what the point is to get somebody who, two people who think very differently from each other, they're gonna meet on like Zoom, and it's a moderated discussion between them where you go through things like, what's your fears, what's your view, how would you compromise here? And, and we have never seen an example, as far as I know, where two people have gotten off of that and hated each other. Usually you see the humanity in each other. So in terms of that, I think whether it's a friend, it's showing your vulnerability and your humanity and your fear to them, um, hopefully they can show that back to you and to understand. On the internet, rhetorically, I don't really have an answer because I think, I, I don't know if too many people have ever been convinced of anything on the internet, uh, but I also do think it's important to represent your position there. But the best you can do, and again, this is me giving myself advice as well, is when you're gonna be in an argument on the internet, for instance, is to try to see the face and the human person behind it. Humans are complicated. Uh, and awesome, you know, but everybody is, is not this kind of flat avatar you see when you're on the internet. Gotcha. Could I do a quick follow-up to that? Like, okay, would that tactic then work with relatives per se? Like yeah. asking, maybe? <laughs> I, think, I think if you're talking to a relative and, you know, their issue bothers you or whatever, um, I think showing yourself to be human, showing your concern and understanding their humanity and, and not going into, look, if your dad is, you know, a hardcore Trumper or whatever it is, whatever you don't like, your dad's not evil, right? Or, or you know, if your dad likes, loves Joe Biden and you can't stand him, your dad's not evil, right? He thinks that's right. It's, it's part of what military stuff, you guys know I'm a veteran, you always have to think about the fact like Al-Qaeda, for instance, thinks they're right. They think they're the ethical ones. You have to think about it through that perspective. So, yeah. Thanks. Al Qaeda is not right, though. I just want to be very clear about that. Hey, Congressman. Uh, thank you so much for your service uh, on all levels in the military and what you're doing in Congress right now. My name is Drew Margulis. I'm part time SSP Masters, and I work in the uh, defense industry full time. Um, and I'm from your neck of the woods, Naperville. 
That's ah, where, cool. That's where yeah. I grew up. Nice. Yeah. Um, and, and actually, you're you're where my roommate, who's a conservative, and I is like a blue dog Democrat bond. You know, we we look at you for leadership and appreciate that. Great. Oh, you guys are both of my supporters. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. No, thanks. I yeah. appreciate it. Yeah, but I think it's a testament to like two people with very differing views who can live together and have a hell of yeah. a good time. You know, and scream at each other, but then hug it out after. But what I bless you for bringing up Alcoholics Anonymous. I, I have a soft spot for that, and I'm just curious how you think we can leverage those types of organizations today uh, and for the type of benefit they brought back then and still to this day. And like, how do we revive a lot of those to bring society back into, you know, appreciating family values and other uh, institutions like that? Yeah. I mean, it's a great question and, you know, I don't have the magic bullet answer, but, you know, back in, when AA, you, uh, whatever the year it was formed, whatever it was, that was there was about a one-year to two-year period where AA, Future Farmers of America, the Lions Club, Kiwanis, all this was formed, and it was formed because government was failing people, and you know n they, people realized nobody else is coming. Like we have this view in America that there's always going to be somebody that's going to come and rescue us from whatever moment we're in, because there kind of always has been. That's not happening. Like, we are the people that have to come and rescue us. There's no magic, you know, person that's going to come down on a unicorn and say, here's the, here's the solution. And, and I think, so what you saw then was people that felt disconnected, depressed, and they said, nobody's coming. We have to be the ones for change. That's that moment we're in now. And I think one thing you see in the, the skyrocketing mental health crisis, the, the stuff we're coming out after COVID, where people feel isolated, they hate each other, there is a desperate need for human contact. Even for those of us that don't necessarily love human contact all the time, right? There is a desperate need for humanity. And I think when people understand that, and when the answer to the mental health, I mean, seriously, like being able to talk about mental health is extremely important, but recognizing some of that solution also is just reconnecting people with people. That's how I think it comes back organically. It's not going to be a bill in Congress, you know? And, and people look because it's the only thing that's on TV or on the internet. People look to DC to solve everything. DC solves only a few things. We're good at, you know, building a military and building your roads. Everything else, we pretty much suck at. And it's your guys' job to do that. So, yeah, that's my Thank rant. You. Appreciate you it. Bet. Thank you for your service, Congressman. Uh, my name is Carlos Chacon. Uh, I am a foreign service grad student, and I used to work for a company in Rockford, your district, and I know some people that they call you a rhino. Yeah, well, <laughs> I know uh, a lot of people that call me that. Yeah. <laughs> so I am Venezuelan-American, and I know how dangerous it is when a political party is kidnapped by populism and hate. So my two questions are, first, what is your plan to work against the Republicans being kidnapped by MAGA, populism, Trump, etc. And how do you do that? Can you bring some optimism towards that? Because it's very hard to see it. And second, following on your words about staff, how do I intern for you? <laughs> <laughs> you got a resume drop in the back, yep, right? Yep. Bring, yeah. uh, no, we're happy, to, we're happy to chat with you about it. Uh, just reach out to the office on that. Um, yeah, look, I mean, in terms of the, in terms of, you know, the party look, I, I mean, the Republican Party is going through a bad moment right now, in my view. Um, and, and I think my hope is that's a cycle. My hope is that, you know, sanity prevails. There's, I know there's people in this room that probably would not consider themselves pro-Trump, but would consider themselves moderate to conservative. You're going to be part of that solution of remaking that. And I think, I personally think if the Republican Party continues down this road, it'll cease to be a party eventually, because I think it's unsustainable. So all you can do is just be... Just be honorable to what you believe. Like, that's it. That, by the way, that's the hardest thing to do is to take a step the very first time. Melissa could share this with you as well. Because when you speak out, that's when you lose your social group. That's when your social group turns on you. And that is sometimes something worse than death. And uh, I've been through that for a while. And, and I know she has in some of that too. Um, but that's where you can look at yourself in the mirror and feel pretty good about it. In terms of, uh, you're talking about, where are you from again? Uh, I'm Venezuelan American. Okay. You know, one of the really dangerous things that we see in Central and South America is when a new government comes in and then prosecutes the old government. And then, you know, it's based on fear, darkness, lies, stuff like that. My wife is Salvadorian. 
And, uh, you know, we, we see a lot of that as well. Um, and that's why we have to be very careful when we talk about prosecuting prior. That's why I was so against all this locker up chant in the election, right? Um, there is a difference, however, in when you have an attempted insurrection on the country. And I think a country then requires accountability. Self-governance is really hard. It's much easier to have an authoritarian. Trust me, it is much easier. You don't have to think about anything. Um, self-governance is hard, but there has to be a basic level of trust among everybody in self-governance. And that also includes that if you lose, you're going to lose honorably. Thank you. Yep. I know you can't get into a lot of the details of the work of the January 6th committee, but do you think accountability is achievable yeah. as you define it? I do. So we're not a criminal investigation, so we're not going to, we can't throw anybody in jail. Certainly DOJ can look at our work and make decisions off of that. It's public. It will be public when we, when we produce it. Um, for me, accountability is less about, you know, we put out the report, we have our hearings that next day being accountable, and it's about historic accountability. I'm going to tell you, anybody that is out there pretending like January 6th didn't happen or it was tourists or whatever, in five or ten years, they're going to they're gonna be very embarrassed about their role in history. Um, I don't think I'm going to be embarrassed about my role. It's not why I do it. It's not why I've chosen to be on the committee. I don't care if I go down in obscurity and nobody ever talks about me again. But I know that my son's not going to be embarrassed. I, I can't say that with all my colleagues. And I know in five or ten years, with all the disinformation that's out there on January 6th today, in five and ten years, there will be an accurate depiction and portrayal of what happened and who is responsible. And that'll be because of the work of the January 6th committee. So for me, that's the goal. And to make sure that you all can see what went wrong and how to never have that happen again. And hopefully DOJ then can take some of that and make people criminally accountable that deserve it. Um, hi, I, uh, my name's Cole. I'm in the SFS. And... Um, I think we can all agree that you know depolarization and, and compromise is a great thing, especially when it's when it's um, when we have the same values and it's just different ways of getting to those values. But what do we do when those values are contradictory? They can't be put together. And I'm I'm gonna ask about um, something that happened yesterday. There was an anti-trans protest that happened near or on campus. Um, what do we do? How do we decrease polarization with people who are like, oh, you shouldn't exist, or like, oh, um, like your religion doesn't matter? Like, how do we, what do we do about that? You just move on with your life, I think. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, if people won't accept you, if people, you know, have values that are completely, that you can't coexist, and there's some of that, right? Like, I, I could not find compromise with Vladimir Putin, right? I mean, you know, in some cases that's the case, and that's where you have to be accountable to yourself and your own life and try to move on from it, you know. Now, I'm not saying if somebody's doing an anti-trans protest that you shouldn't go out and counter-protest. Maybe you should, right? But you shouldn't go home if you can't control it and try to replay that in your mind so much that it hurts you. Mm -hmm. uh, look, I mean, compromise, guys, is not, is not mealy-mouthed, you know, let's all just get along. It's really just understanding that the other side of a political argument is human and they're also not your enemy. And I think if we can get to that basic level, then we're gonna be in a really good spot. Thank you. Yep. Hi, Congressman, how are you? Uh, my name is John, I'm a freshman in the Foreign School of Foreign Service um, <clears throat> and I'm from Long Island, New York. I also work part-time on the Hill for Representative Andrew Garbarino, who, like yourself, takes some tough votes sometimes and. As an intern, I hear a lot of it on the phone. Oh, yeah, you guys have yeah. the hardest job. <laughs> I appreciate that. So my question is, when certain elected officials have consistent public disapproval with their party, the examples I that come to mind are now Representative uh, Republican Representative Van Drew and former Representative Justin Amash, a lot of people will throw their hands up and leave the party. So my question is, what has made you stay with the Republicans through your disapproval? And the natural follow-up to that being, what about the 2022 Republican Party is, <clears throat> is so redeemable as we approach a midterm election? You know, look, it's a, great, it's a great question, and I answer it with this. 
the party that I joined when I became a Republican, I was six years old when I started paying attention to politics. Probably some of you in here were like that. Um, the party that I believe in that's missing today, I still believe, I hope, can be fixed and solved. That's my hope. And uh, look, the Republican Party's been here since the 1850s. It's probably going to be around for a long time. Uh, so is the Democratic Party. And what you have, in the past we really had four parties. You had liberal Republicans, conservative Republicans, liberal Democrats, conservative Democrats. We really have gone from four parties to two. And that's where I think you have to fight within the soul of the party. Now I will say though, um, that if this goes on for a while, and I see that there is no redemption for the Republican Party, I'm not wed to being a Republican. I'm not a Democrat. I don't, I don't believe in you know, 99% of Democratic policies. It doesn't mean I think they're bad. It's just not who I am. Um, but yeah, there, there will certainly, if without change, be a point at which I would no longer consider myself Republican. But I think the party's worth fighting for at this moment, particularly when it's being taken over by authoritarians. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Let's go over here. Congressman, thank you so much for being here tonight, and thanks for all that you do. Um, that's kind of the perfect segue into my question. Oh, also, um, I'm Jack. I'm a freshman in the School of Foreign Service, and I'm from Pittsburgh. Um, so that's perfect segue into my question, which is, as you talk about tribalism, um, I start to think about um, some of the other democracies in the world, like Germany and New Zealand, um, that are sometimes considered some of the healthiest democracies in the world, and they typically have about four to five parties. And so my question is, after you just talked about how we used to have somewhat more of a four-party system than a two, um, is now the time for a breakup of this two-party system? And if not, um, what do you propose we do about it? Where do you where uh, look? We I would it? love to see it. I, I mean, I would love to see competition. Um, the problem is the barriers in place are really high. Um, and let's say, let's, say, let's say I decided to run as an independent, right, for president. Sounds great to everybody. It's like, oh, good. And then we start getting into issues. We have been brainwashed to believe there's only two sides to every issue. So then somebody asked me, are you pro-gun or anti-gun? And I answer that question. Oh, well, I'm the other side, so I'm going to go vote for this person. That's what we've... You have been programmed by the man in the deep state to believe that there are only two sides to every issue. There's actually a bajillion sides to every issue. Even on the really controversial things, there's like different increments of stuff. Um, that's the problem. So how do we break that mindset? And then the institutional barriers, if you want to run as an independent in Illinois, for instance, for Congress, you have to have like 10,000 signatures from people that have never once voted in a primary. Or if you want to run as a Republican or Democrat, you need 300, right? So those are some of the institutional hurdles. But I would love to see competition happen. I would love it. And if you don't mind me asking, is there anything that this current Congress and this current system can do now to facilitate that? Because there are people on both sides that, like, that would like to see it. Yeah, I mean, look, I don't think we can do anything to facilitate it. I think you guys can. And I think, you know, if there is ultimately a movement and understanding that we, like, let's say for a presidential candidate as an independent, we want somebody that's going to change the system. We don't care what they personally believe, and it's not even about issues, it's about saving democracy. And come hell or high water, we're gonna make sure this happens. You can make it happen. Um, but if we get back into our, yeah, but the thing that's most important is where do you stand on taxation? Where do you stand on these tired issues we argue all the time? You'll never break the two-party system. But if we can get to the point where people are thinking, a presidential candidate, for instance, that says, we're going to let Congress decide these issues. My job is to sign them if it's a bipartisan agreement and to protect you because, you know, our president is obviously very powerful when it comes to foreign policy. We could change the system. Can we get there? I don't know. Good question. Thanks. Good evening, Congressman. My name's Charlie. I'm a sophomore in the college. Um, so you're the first speaker in this How to Heal series. And my question for you is this. Who should be the next three speakers in this series? Who else should be, we be listening to, either in academia or in journalism or on the other side of the aisle in this conversation? Can you guys get Jesus in here? <laughs> so that would be good. We need some Jesus in here. Um, no, look, I, uh, um, somebody I really, 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 really admire, who I think you guys should have, is Arthur Brooks. Um, Arthur Brooks uh, used to be American Enterprise Institute. He's, uh, he's conservative, but you'd never necessarily know it. Uh, he talks about human empowerment, human, you know, the importance of humanity, 
Uh, he's actually written a new book about the second half of your life, basically, and how your career peaks way before you realize it and uh, how to embrace that. Uh, one of the smartest, that's who I know on the conservative side. I find the equivalent of him on the Democratic side and either put them together or have them separate, but those are a couple I'd say offhand. I'll keep my answer short because I know we're running low on time and a ton of people. Well, we got a couple thank more you. questions. Yeah, here. thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being here, Congressman. Uh, my name is Gabe. I'm a sophomore in the college. I, I was wondering, you were talking a little bit before about the direction of your party. You know, obviously, just today, Congressman Fred Upton, your colleague, yeah. announced he won't be running for re-election. You've also announced you won't be facing primary voters in the next election, and four of the 10 Republicans who voted to impeach President Trump last year have announced that. I'm curious what message you think that sends about that kind of fight for the party you were talking about, about which kind of faction of the party has the strength right now. Yeah, so the question is this, like, what's, what's the better message, not taking on an unwinnable fight or taking it on and getting crushed? Which one does Trump gloat more over, right? Look, in my case personally, even if none of this was happening, I probably wouldn't run again anyway. I've been in 12 years. 12 years is a long time in this job. I have a new kid, right? Fairly new marriage. Uh, my, I, I am so passionate about fighting for uh, healing in this country and the political stuff that I think it actually it, it hinders me being in the House right now because I have to take all these controversial votes while then talking about some of these other big things and you lose audiences. Um, but look, I, I think it, it, send, it doesn't necessarily send a message about the people. It sends a message about the party. And the party is, look, you, have, you, you say you want honorable people to go and vote their conscience, and then when they do, you throw them out. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think it's not the best message, but I think it's the reality of where we are, which is, hey, you know, we're, we're in a moment where if you vote to impeach the president for an insurrection, it's tough to survive. Thank you. Thanks. Let's take... Two more, and then I've got a closing question because I know you got yeah, to get out of here. Yeah, and anybody behind the two front ones, you were slow. <laughs> so don't blame us. Got a fast one then. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, hi there, Congressman. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, my name is Zach. I'm a sophomore in the School of Foreign Service. And my question sort of segues from the previous one, which is we've had a great conversation today, obviously, about the origins of polarization and division among the American electorate and the public. But I guess going into this on the electoral level, um, you know, one of the main reasons for polarization in Congress has been uh, uh, gerrymandered congressional districts. Oh, yeah. And the fact that, yeah, I'm sure no stranger to this, but the fact that, you know, the number of even districts has been dwindling, you know, year after year. And I guess on a practical level, how do we foster, you know, candidates who are more moderate or open to compromise or are more you know, ideologically heterodox, considering the fact that these districts are just becoming more and more polarized. Vote in primaries. So I have a, 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 you know, country first, the organization, we've got a movement called Primary First, where we're encouraging people, if you live in a Republican district, for instance, you may be an independent or a Democrat, and you're like, I'm not a Republican, I'm not pulling a Republican ballot, you should. Because if you're going to be represented by a Republican, you have no voice then in who that's going to be. Um, and, and so... I think on the, on the near term, it's that, vote in a primary, pick. Uh, on the long term, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, redistricting reform, sure. I don't know if that's necessarily gonna happen. Um, I think it's, it's uh, you know, changing in the financial system. And I do think there's real merit in things like ranked choice voting. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, we'll do one more here. Thank you so much for being here. Um, my name is Ken Searing. I am a master's of policy management student here at the McCord School. And I come from a bit of an unorthodox background of being a Peace Corps volunteer who became a police officer for the past 10 years. Dang, man. And, <laughs> <laughs> and what one thing I noticed over the past several years, especially getting up to 2020, was a growing belief in the big lie, the, a lot of the uh, election disinformation that we saw happening. I mean, in fact, we saw that uh, police officers um, off duty from around the country, some of them are in trouble for yeah. assaulting the Capitol. Yeah. And a lot of this that I that I heard was because they uh, didn't, many of them didn't understand how things worked or were supposed to work. And I'm wondering uh, what your opinion would be on the state of civics education in this country yeah. and, you know, like forms of national service and how more of those could be doing a good job to bring. That's a great back. question. I, look, civics education needs to be reprioritized. You know, the question is, can we agree on what civics are now? You know, I don't know. Um, but I think that has to be reprioritized. You know, the importance of voting, the importance of paying attention. Um, you know, the importance of being a citizen, right, of, of, of being a good citizen. 
Uh, I think that is important. What was the second part? Because you had mentioned the civics and then... Uh, National service. So AmeriCorps, Peace Corps, Teacher of Yeah. So look, I would love to see something similar to the GI Bill for things like AmeriCorps, Peace Corps. Uh, I don't want to see a draft in the military. I I still want you guys to have to register for the draft because we may need you at some point. But the one thing I don't want to do, I'm a lieutenant colonel in the military. I don't want anybody working for me that didn't want to be there. Um, that's why we're so good because people are there voluntarily. Um, but I think, you know, if you choose to go to the military, AmeriCorps, Peace Corps, there's got to be some real incentives for that. I think that changed the other, the thing it does beyond just taking you out of your shell is if you're raised in a, like a rural white town and now all of a sudden you're working with somebody from the inner city that you've never met anybody like that. Well, that, that, that is game changing and life changing for you, as you all know, when you've come across people that are from very different backgrounds. So I think you're right. And I'll say too quickly on the police officer side of things, one of the biggest tragedies, my buddy is Michael Fanone now, who was the officer that was drugged down the stairs and beaten. You know, he went into this like a hardcore conservative Republican, right? And he's like, all his friends have disowned him, his cop friends. Because they thought that, you know, what he was doing was, you know, feeding the democratic narrative. Like, this is an officer that was doing his job was almost killed. And uh, between police and the people wearing military uniforms or veterans that were at that have done more to discredit the military. Thankfully, you know, it's still bipartisan appreciated and I think police is too. Uh, But, yeah, that was a big disappointment. Thank you. I want to close out with two super quick questions. Um, and they kind of are on the same theme, individual responsibility, right? This is all about how to heal. And we can talk about some of the big systemic changes we, we need to make, but we all need to play a role. So my first question about individual responsibility is you. You're stepping down. We've talked about, you've talked about how you're stepping down. You're, you're jumping into to country first. What does the fight uh, look like for you moving forward, and uh, does that include a presidential <laughs> run. You know, I, I had to ask. Yeah. <laughs> Look, I, so in, when it comes to like individual responsibility, your responsibility is to be a good citizen, right? To be a good person. Uh, don't put, this is something, this is a mistake I made early on and a mistake that I think everybody makes early on in politics is you put the weight of the world on your shoulders and you put what's going wrong on your shoulders and you carry that burden. You can't. I mean, I can't stop until I'm president someday, maybe. You know, this is the second question. <laughs> Unless you're president, you can't stop you know, Russia from invading Ukraine. Even if you are, you probably can't stop it. So don't bear that burden, but know what's going on and understand the importance of that. In terms of for me, I mean, look, honestly, it, it's funny. I, I have no plans on running for president. I haven't, this isn't like some, and it's hard when you, politicians, because they're all cold and calculated out like 20 years, but by the way, everybody in politics that has a five or 10 year plan always fails to achieve it, right? (laughs) Everybody fails to achieve it. They're all gonna be this chairman or they're gonna be that person. I think the key to life is just do the right thing, be conscious of the future, and then see what opportunities open up or where that, look, my faith tells me that if there is a moment at which I'm needed to rise to some occasion, I'm willing to do it, but I'm not planning it. So when it comes to president, look, I'd never rule it out. Um, if this, if country first explodes and there's a demand for people that are speaking differently and I'm that guy, sure. Uh, but I'm not going to sit back and, and, and plan my way to that. All right. Um, Congressman, um, first of all, I want to thank all of you for coming. I want to thank Georgetown College Republicans and the Bipartisan Coalition for co-sponsoring with us. I want to thank our fantastic Spring Fellow, Alyssa Farr Griffin, for helping to bring the Congressman. I, I said to her, you know, Alyssa, we want to do the series on how to heal. And she's like, oh, I know a guy. And, uh, <laughs> and here you are. So thank you. Um, and, you know, Congressman, uh, the Jesuits here at Georgetown teach us all from day one of our freshman orientation that we are all women and men for others. Your entire career has exemplified that. And so along with everyone else, thank you for your service, your continued service, whatever that may look like in the future, and for helping us kick off this this incredibly important and sadly too timely conversation. Yeah, thank you guys, thank you, appreciate it. Thank you all.